Um, so thank you for coming tonight to the first in our series of uh, Friends of NSM Community Lectures. Uh, we have four more planned during the year, during the calendar year, uh, along the theme of science and health and its impact upon you, your loved ones, and the community. Um, this is a new series. This is the first in a, in a beginning series where each calendar year we will be having a program on campus uh, evening lectures um, thematically uh, following through the calendar year, um, with next year's being uh, related to energy, to the science of energy. Um, the uh, NSM, Friends of NSM, is also a society of, of generous people who are interested in getting to know the college more, getting to know the university more, and exploring how they might be able to help or wish to help. Uh, must achieve the uh, excellence that we're working towards. Um, so, let me just begin um, to, by uh, introducing to you Jan Aki Gustafsson, who's going to uh, um, kick off the lecture this year, um, and uh, introduce our speaker. Jan Aki is the director of the Center for Nuclear Receptors and Cell Signaling here at the University of Houston. Um, the center opened in January of 2009 when Yanaki moved here uh, and began building a second group um, here at the University of Houston. He still has strong ties to the Karolinska Institute where he was for many years. Um, and uh, is, is helping us again bring national recognition to our college and uh, build up the, uh, the quality of uh, science and education uh, within science and mathematics. So uh, with that said, I'll introduce Jan Aki. Thank you very much. So it's a true honor and pleasure to uh, introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Bruce Spiegelman, who is a very well-known scientist in this country. And we're extremely grateful to him for taking the time to come down here from Boston. He has um, a illustrious career. He started um, actually at Princeton and then very early moved on to where he is now, to Harvard Medical School and Lena Carter Cancer Institute. He uh, has uh, a long list of awards and uh, just to mention a few. He has obtained Bristol Myers Squibb Award for Distinguished Achievement in Metabolic Research. He has obtained the Karolinska Institute Rolf Luft Award in Endocrinology. Rolf Luft was a very famous father of endocrinology of the Karolinska Institute. So again, it's very nice to know that Bruce got the Distinguished Award. He's of course a member of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the highest distinctions you could have in this country. And he just told me that he has got now the Branting, the Banting Award, which will be given to him later on in Philadelphia. He is one of those scientists who uh, surprise everybody by continuing to deliver all the time uh, breakthrough discoveries, which makes everybody interested in his research. And it also has uh, very strong implications for one of the threats in this country and in many countries in the Western world, that is obesity and diabetes, where we need very good science to have a chance to combat these terrible, fatal diseases. <coughs> so uh, one of the things that he has done is to elucidate how adipose tissue, fat tissue, is formed and he has done some very nice studies over the years which will perhaps help us to combat obesity. But most, uh, I would say, surprisingly and uh, significantly, like I said, he has continued <coughs> this uh, very successful research. And recently, uh, he had a paper in the well-known um, uh, journal Nature, where only good papers are published, and he has published several of them. And uh, 
he has discovered, and I think he will talk about that. He has done many things, but he will, uh, I think, be uh, generous enough to talk uh, to us about his recent discoveries, about an exciting new, uh, which may be a hormone called irisin, which is secreted by the muscle and affects the fat tissue to make it uh, from white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. White adipose tissue is not so good for you. Brown adipose tissue is good for you. So I think that this recent discovery, very fresh discovery, will uh, uh, has a great uh, deal of promise to combat these terrible diseases. So uh, we all look forward to your recent discoveries to hear about them, Bruce. Thank you very much, Yanaki, for that generous introduction. I was enjoying that so much. I'm sitting here sipping my wine. I have <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. It sounds like it's a very exciting time at uh, the University of Houston. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. And I'm glad to kick off this uh, lecture series. So, from what I understand, this lecture series represents a little bit of an interesting challenge in that there are people who are molecular biologists and biochemists in the audience, but also people who are from other areas of science and also friends from the community. So I will try to find a little ground tonight between not making it too technical for people who are not in the science world, while at the same time not insulting people who are scientists and providing us information so you can hopefully understand what I mean. So, the first thing one has to do nowadays is to do a disclosure. So here's my disclosure. The work that I'm about to describe was entirely funded from public sources, the NIH. It will describe the discovery of a new hormone called irisin. Irisin has been licensed to, from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute to Enver Therapeutics, and I am a co-founder and shareholder in Enver Therapeutics. So, think of that what you will. <laughs> So, um, let me pick up on something that Anandia said, which is that obesity and diabetes has uh, reached epidemic proportions in much of the United States. For my friends in Texas here, very, very rare. <laughs> Greater than 30% of the um, adult population uh, is considered um, obese. Um, now, for those of you who are not Americans <coughs> and are smirking, I have to show this slide, which is this shows projected incidence of type 2 diabetes, the kind of diabetes that is linked to obesity, around the world in 2025. And you will notice that although the United States is bright orange, we are not the darkest color. Um, Brazil, Mexico, um, and um, Saudi Arabia are projected to have higher incidence of type 2 diabetes, and indeed, much of Europe is predicted to have as high a, an incidence of type 2 diabetes as the United States. You're not okay, sweet and still. <laughs> you were a little better, but not, but not too much better. So clearly what we are talking about is a worldwide problem that represents a challenge to the health and healthcare system really around the, the, the entire planet. Now, let me make a few comments about fat tissue and fat cells. So in broad terms, there's two kinds of fat cells. The kind called white fat are the kind that you probably think of when you think of adipose cells or fat tissue, if you think about it at all, that is. So this is a cell type that is specialized for the storage of energy. It has low mitochondria, no protein called UCP1, and is pro-inflammatory in the context of obesity. And I, I have to say that it's regulated by a nuclear receptor um, called PPAR10. It's actually our work on this area that first introduced me to the anomaly of this research. Now, the important point is that there's another kind of fat cell that is less numerous in the body of mammals called brown fat. So brown fat is interesting because it is specialized to dissipate chemical energy in the form of heat and defends the body, the mammalian body, against hypothermia and obesity. 
It converts chemical energy, fat and glucose, um, into heat by having a high uh, number of a subcellular organelle called mitochondria. Those mitochondria express a special protein called uncoupling protein <coughs> 1. And together, they can dissipate energy in the form of heat. And the specific molecular transcriptional regulators are PPAR gamma, PGC1, alpha, and beta. And most recently, a molecule we discovered that's really specializes cells for the brown fat lineage called PRDM6. Now, there was a lore, really since my time in the beginning of my own scientific career, is that brown fat was abundant in rodents, small mammals, and, and um, uh, infant humans. There was considerable doubt about whether adults had brown fat, whether it was significant. And this was rediscovered uh, several years ago when PET scanning using radioactive glucose became a popular technique for looking at tumor metastases. And, and people often found that humans have hot spots for glucose uptake in the supraclavicular area around the neck. And, but these were always symmetrical, and so it didn't really seem that that was likely to be tumors. And later, uh, studies were done, these three papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, open biopsies were done, and this was identified as brown fat. Just so to give you an idea, these the same individuals kept at warm temperature and a cool, couple of hours at cool temperatures. Cool temperatures are enough to activate the brown fat to take up more glucose and therefore to show better in PET scanning. So these are similar images of the same individuals in warm and cool. So it is now clear that adults have, most if not all adult humans, have significant deposits of brown fat. Now the only question is, what does it contribute to whole body energy metabolism? Does it correlate with the negatively correlate with obesity and diabetes, because we might expect that people with a propensity toward obesity and diabetes perhaps have less brown fat, and new individuals have more. So that's sort of the starting point of some of the analyses that I'm going to tell you about. So I want to tell you one other point that is a little bit technical, but I can't avoid it. They're really, the word brown fat is really used for two different kinds of cells. One is the classical kind of brown fat, that occurs in rodents and in infant humans in the, uh, in the intrascapular region between the shoulder blades. <coughs> but it's been recognized for decades that brown fat cells can emerge in white fat depots. Um, and they're UCP1 positive, and these are actually different cell types. We showed that in, in 2008. So to summarize this, I'm trying not to get too technical. Let me just summarize. There are three kinds, of fat, actually three kinds of, at least three kinds of fat cells: white fat cells that store energy, and two different kinds of brownish fat cells. The classical kind, the scapular depot, and then brown fat cells that can emerge in many or most of the white fat depots, especially in the subcutaneous fat. And we, my lab calls these beige fat cells. Other labs call them bright cells. There's a little nomenclature issue that we haven't straightened out yet. But just remember that there are two different kinds of brown fat. Now, why do we care about this? Let, let, me, let me show, I can give you many examples from the literature, but I'll show you one from our own laboratory. We made a strain of mice that expresses this molecule called PRDM16, this brown fat regulator in all the adipose depots. And what we saw in this mouse was a browning of the white fat. So let me show you what I mean by that. This is stain, histologically, immunostain for uncoupling protein 1. So the brown are cells expressing uncoupling protein 1. This is what I mean by browning emerging from the white fat. These are otherwise white fat cells, and you get pockets of UCP1 positive cells. That's what this transgenic mouse has. And this transgenic mouse has improved glucose tolerance. This is a very simple test for diabetes that probably most of the people in the audience have had. This is when you go to the doctor's office and you fast. And pregnant women always have this. Uh, men, if they suspect you of having diabetes, that you'll do an overnight fast, you'll drink a sugary drink, and then by doing periodic blood tests, you can tell whether your body handles glucose properly. So, 
This is a wild type mouse, a normal mouse that's put on a high fat diet. And this glucose tolerance, this is time in minutes, glucose blood levels. And this is abnormal. It should be going up and down faster. This is abnormal glucose tolerance or impaired glucose tolerance. Our mouse with more brown fat looks more like a wild type mouse. So this is one example to say that by just by browning the white fat through the action of this molecule, PRDF16, this is a less diabetic animal. This animal is healthier in terms of its glucose homeostasis. So that's why we all should care about this. So the question is, what should we do about this? And surprisingly, it, it, we learned that one thing you want to do if you want a better glucose homeostasis and better browning of your white adipose tissues is to exercise. And I'll tell you why. So in this recent <laughs> the doctor says, that's not a rash, it's moss. You need to be more active than a tree. We, we all sort of know that. But I'll tell you another reason why, why that is true. Let me take a very, very brief technical term. Um, try to keep your eyes open. I'll get through this very quickly. There's a molecule called PGC1-alpha that uh, one of my fellows, Penny Boucher, discovered in, in the late 1990s. It controls mitochondrial formation, including mitochondrial formation in muscle, among other tissues. And other investigators showed that PGC1-alpha was induced in exercise. It was shown by other investigators that this molecule called PGC1-alpha is induced in exercise in mice, in rats, in humans, running, swimming, walking. Most recently, deep massage has been shown to induce PGC1-alpha. It's true, this is science translational medicine. So this slide summarizes about 14 years' work from my lab and the work of others relating to PGC1-alpha and muscle. And the sort of surprising, shocking, and wonderful thing is that this one molecule gives muscle, endows muscle, with many of the benefits of exercise. So this is what we were originally studying, mitochondrial biogenesis. But then we and other people showed that it increases neuromuscular junctions. When you exercise, the relationship between your muscles and the nerves gets stronger. Angiogenesis, which is blood vessel development, fiber type switching toward more oxidative muscle, fatty acid oxidation, and most exciting, perhaps, anti-dystrophy and anti-atrophy. So one thing inherently, probably everybody in the audience knows, is if you don't use your muscles, you lose them. That's not just war, that is literally true. If you if your arm or leg is in a cast, or if you were bedridden, your muscle atrophies very rapidly. Your bodies have evolved so that if you're not using your muscles, your body recognizes your muscle as a source of calories and simply mobilizes your muscle and burns it as an energy source. Exercise counters muscle atrophy. That's a fact. That's one of the reasons why it's very important to exercise. So we showed in 2006, and other people have also showed that if you turn PGC-1 alpha on a transgenic mouse, even if the mouse doesn't move, even if the, if the muscle is denervated, that means cut the nerve, the muscle doesn't waste. So apparently this is a very strong signal saying do not waste. Okay. So I'll show you an experiment by one of my collaborators that was very inspirational. And he took much more patients than I have. That is, he took transgenic mice expressing PGC1 alpha in muscle, doing all these good things, and they waited. They just had the mouse in the cage for many months. And they saw something really interesting. The, the mice moved the same amount, they ate the same amount, but the control mouse got fat, as mice are like humans. If they sit and they don't do anything, and they just eat, and they live a normal life, they get quite fat as they get older. The transgenic mouse with PGC-1 alpha elevated in muscle, though it did no more work, and then we have techniques to measure their movement, 
Well, when they did no more work, they were leaner and they weighed less. Well, the rest <coughs> of the audience can agree with me about this. This guy, James Jewell, had something to say about this. That the first law of thermodynamics says that matter, now we say matter and energy, are ne neither created nor destroyed. In order for there to be the same movement, the same food intake, but one animal weighs less than another, there must be something else going on if we believe that matter and energy are conserved. So we became very interested in this, and I'll show you um, that this is where Thomas Wallstrom, the postdoc, came to my laboratory from Gothenburg, Sweden, and took on this problem. And what he found was that having PGC1 alpha elevated in muscle, that is, this molecule that gives muscle a lot of the attributes of exercise, caused a browning of the white fat. That's an interesting observation. Having the PGC1 alpha in the muscle increases expression of UCP1 and makes the, actually makes the adipose tissue have patches of these brown-like fat cells. We, we insured for the efficient, biomedical aficionados, we, we assured ourselves that it wasn't leaky expression of the transgene. There was no PGC1, because I know that's what David Moore is immediately thinking, that there is no PGC1 alpha expression in the adipose tissues. It is. It's but it suggests that there is communication between the muscle and the fat. Now, people have thought about these things before. We're not the first ones to think about it, but it really suggested some ways that we can get and handle on this at a molecular level. Let's skip this slide and then go to this slide. So let me show you the crucial experiment. So we knew that PGC went out in muscle would ground the adipose tissues. There had to be some kind of indirect communication. So we did a, uh, a supernatant transfer experiment, very simple experiment. We took primary muscle cells, muscle cells in a dish. We added uh, viral vectors expressing either PGC1 alpha or a green protein called green fluorescent protein, just to control the protein. We then took supernatants from the cells. These cells grow in a dish. We literally took the liquid off the cells after an overnight incubation and placed them on the primary fat cells. And said, what happened? It turns out that <coughs> from cells that saw PGC1 out, induced uncoupling protein 1, and some of these other molecular markers, it doesn't matter what they are, they're markers of brown fat, compared to the cells that received green fluorescent protein, a random control protein. This was good news for us because the communication between muscle and fat could have come in many ways. It could have been through the central nervous system. There's nothing wrong with the central nervous system. I just don't understand it. I'm a biochemist. I do understand an activity in medium. That's something I can, I, I, we felt like we could sink our teeth into. Um, Neural circuitry and all the other possibilities are simply outside our tent. So this led to the hunt for, for this guy. So what is it that fat cell, what, what factor or factors do fat cells secrete under the influence of PGC-1 alpha that tells the adipose tissues to turn brown and increase energy expenditure? That's the function. So we, we approach this about four different ways, well, many biochemical ways, but in the way we eventually at least partially saw this was sort of informatically. We basically determined, uh, using a very popular technique called affymetrix gene expression arrays, we could measure the relative quantitative expression of every gene in the genome in cells with and without PGC1 alpha. This is a standard technique. And then using there are algorithms, multiple algorithms, that can predict who might be secreted. They're not that accurate, but we, we use several of them. And so we look for really proteins that would be inserted into membranes and may be secreted. None of these predictions are perfect, but we use several of them, and we were open-minded about it. And then we did biochemistry, cellular and biochemical analyses to look for secretion of individual factors. And it led us to a molecule called FNBC5, saving lots of painful details and, and many, many months of work getting 
to this one molecule. So in the end, this is a protein, a membrane protein called FNDC5. And for reasons that I still don't understand, it's commercially available. I guess these days there are companies that make every known protein in the genome, because there were only two papers ever published on this subject, and they're not of particular interest, but it was available from Agno, so we bought it. And this shows you the effect of purified FNDC5 on relative expression of uncoupling protein 1. For, the, for those not even still, uncoupling protein 1 really is the key functional protein of a brown fat cell, and it's brown fat specific. So that's why I always just have bar graphs of the UCP1. It's a very important, it's a surrogate, but a very important surrogate for brown fat. <laughs> so the red bars are the effect of FNDC5, 20 nanomolar, quite reasonable levels, on UCP1 expression. It also turns on a number of other uh, proteins um, that are elevated in, in brown fat. <clears throat> so this is in the grounding of white fat. These are subcutaneous white fat cells. We get this effect. We did exactly the same experiment on classical brown fat. I mentioned this about the two different kinds of brown fat. In the interscapular classical brown fat, we see no effect at all. So this really works on the browning of the white adipose tissue, not the classical, not the classical tissue. Okay, so what is FNDC5? Fibromectin domain was clawed by two groups in 2002 as a muscle-enriched non-human. Interestingly, it was annotated as an intracellular protein. So both groups, they didn't do much functional analysis, so I wouldn't be too critical, but basically they missed the boat that this is a potential uh, secreted molecule. And it's enriched in heart, muscle, and CNS. In fact, I give my postdoc public both a tremendous credit because and not only did he have the sort of scientific strength to recognize this as a potentially secreted molecule, there are two papers that insist on the subject, say it's an intracellular molecule. So you have to be a little bit arrogant, I think, to be a successful research scientist, and Pontus has that quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he was absolutely right. So I'll just show you that this shows transfection, the DNA vector in the cells, will be immunoblot, the cellular fraction, and the supernutent. Um, significant amount of FNDC5 is secreted into the medium, and it's a different size by SDS gel electrophoresis is this technique. And this differential means it has slower electrophoretical mobility, which is usually associated with a larger size. It's modified. Okay. So what is actually the product? So working with mass spectrometry specialists at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, part of medical school, we have Steve Eaton, who's one of the best mass spec people in the world. So we work closely with them to determine what is the piece that is actually secreted. Um, we predicted that the signal peptide would be cleaved. This would be the likely antagonist. That turns out to be true. And of course, the cleavage is actually right about there. So the proportion from about here to about here is the secreted memorial. So this is what is known as a type 1 membrane protein. It has a single membrane spanning hydrophobic region. It's the protein, is a membrane protein, it sticks out into the extracellular space and then it's proteolytically cleaved and shed. You can think of this kind of molecule as being shed from the cell surface. Um, we named this protein irisin after Iris, the Greek messenger goddess, one of the not well studied Greek gods. <laughs> But, um, but I thought Iris, Irisin was an appropriate name because we didn't want a name for any particular function because even though I'm going to tell you about a function tonight, we don't really know that that's its only function. We don't even know that that's its main function. So Iris was the goddess who went from the gods in Olympus to humans on Earth. She was the messenger goddess. And so we gathered the idea that irisin is a polypeptide that's secreted with exercise, as you'll see in a little while, and, um, and um, therefore carries the message from muscle to other tissues. One of the interesting things about irisin, in fact, I don't understand this, I'm a protein biochemist by training, and I don't understand this. It is 100% identical from mouse to man. The cleave portion, the 112 amino acid portion, 
is identical. There isn't even one conservative substitution as we go from house to one. It's not clear for me to me why that would be true or how that would be true. But back up there, for example, insulin is 85% conserved from mouse to man, glucagon 90%. So every single, so when we're playing with mouse virus and we're playing with human virus. The hallmark of thermogenesis is increased respiration without doing any more work. This just showed you this a little bit technical. Using an oxygen sensitive electrode, we can measure how much oxygen cells use in a cuvette. And we have here plus or minus FNDC5, the parent protein. And you can see about a 70, 80% increase in oxygen consumption. And for the visionados, the uncoupled respiration increases about 300%. These are really big effects on, on um, oxygen consumption. So now something which is a little more accessible, and we'll tell you that viruses circulates in both the mouse and man has increased with exercise. So this is at the RNA level. Uh, I'm sorry, this is at the protein level. These are Western blocks. These are protein determinations in mice control and exercise. And these are human subjects, uh, individual subjects. With, uh, they're actually 60-year-old males put on a five-week training regimen of bicycle riding 30 minutes a day, uh, five days a week. Sort of moderate, <coughs> vigorous exercise. Um, and again, we see an increase. I don't show the RNA data. It's increased at the RNA level. And we roughly estimate a plasma concentration of about 50 nanomole. Okay. So now, iris is functioning in vivo. So how do we study this in vivo? There's a technology I have to introduce called adenovirus technology. It's a kind of virus <coughs> which uh, infects uh, mammals. Um, the humans can get adenoviral infections as well. They cause a mild um, a respiratory infection. We use non-infectious adenoviral particles in the laboratory to express genes in vivo. And if you, if you use the viruses to express a gene, you inject it into the bloodstream of the mouse it all gets taken up by the liver. The liver clears that virus, it infects the liver. And then, in the case of a secreted protein, the liver then will secrete the molecule that you want to secrete the protein. So we make adenovirus expressing the parent protein, FNDC5, or again, a green fluorescent protein, just a random control protein. And we get about a two or three-fold increase in circulating irisin using this viral technology. It lasts about 10 days. You can't come back and do it again because, as you might imagine, the adenovirus is immunogenic. If you ever came back and hit the mice with a second injection, they would just go into shock and die immediately. But you get one injection, and it's good for about 10 days, two weeks. So if you're satisfied with that time frame, it's sort of a quick and easy way to modify genetically a mouse. So 10 days experiment, two to three-fold increase in circulating irisin, we, in the adipose tissues, we get about a tenfold increase in uncoupling protein one. Where it hatches a brown fat in the white fat, about a threefold increase in uncoupling protein one protein by Western laws. This says that in vivo, elevating irisin causes um, a browning of the white adipose tissues. Now, when I talk about oxygen consumption, I'm sorry if it's, I have to be a little bit technical. I'm so, uh, we can measure oxygen consumption at the whole body level as well. We, have, we can put mice in an apparatus, which is sealed, and the gases that they produce and use can be measured. So we can measure CO2 um, production and O2 consumption in real time. This shows you O2 consumption of an individual mouse uh, in real time, in night, day, and night. Now, mice are nocturnal, they move more, so they use more oxygen. But if you compare, this is averaging over a number of mice, not individual mice. The black are the ones that got FNDC5 virus, and the white are the ones that got GLP. You can easily see more oxygen consumption. This is significant to less than 0.001. So, yes, 
one injection of the adenovirus expressing FNHC5 was sufficient to really markedly increase energy expenditure in these mice. And correlating with that is improvement of glucose homeostasis. Increases in fasting insulin and improved glucose tolerance. Now, we submitted this paper for publication, and the reviewers, um, reasonably enough, said, is this physiological? What is the evidence that this is not some pharmacological approach? Is this, does FNDC5 virus really mediate some of the effects of exercise? So we addressed that. In a way, we were quite lucky. There is one antibody commercially uh, available against FNDC5 virus, and, and it does neutralize. So one way to knock a protein's function out is if an antibody recognizes it, it often, but not always, will neutralize its function. So I'm going to show you an antibody neutralization experiment. And I'm going to show you mice um, exercising. Yes. Um, ah, there we go. Okay. So we swim mice for 10 days. Twice a day for 90 minutes. I thought you might, uh, I thought you might like to see this in case you've never seen mice exercise. So there's a couple of things about this I want to point out. First of all, mice are good swimmers. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that my postdoc said watching mice swim twice a day for 90 minutes was the most excruciating experience <laughs> of their professional life because according to our institutional animal welfare rules, we can't just let mice swim. We have to watch them. <laughs> so twice a day watching mice swim for 90 minutes apparently did not improve the sanity of my postdocs. But there really is even a scientific uh, a reason to do that. And I'm going to point it out to you here. Watch carefully. They cheat. If you look over here, they tend to piggyback ride. <laughs> they jump on each other's back, they'll float, they'll piggyback ride. So not only do they have to watch the mice, they have to stand there with a pipette. <laughs> make sure that they want to piggyback ride and make sure that they didn't float. So anyway, hopefully that was worth it. And I think it was. <laughs> because this shows so we use the control immunoglobulin or the anti FNDC5 immunoglobulin. Swimming induces recovery in protein 1 as it induces tyrosin. The antibody that's neutralizing blocks, in substantial measure, um, the browning that occurs in the adipose tissue as a consequence of the exercise. So this allowed us to say, with some degree of confidence, this is at least part of the physiological response um, to exercise. You lose the grounding of the adipose tissues in substantial measure, but not necessarily the whole story. Okay, so let me summarize um, that what we what we have shown is starting with the work on PDC and alpha led us to a new molecule that secreted FNDC5 clip forming a new hormone and myokine called myrosin that works on the adipose tissues and browns them. Now, as we go forward here, the reason why my title mentioned other diseases is we don't know that this is the only function of the iris and molecule. Exercise benefits many, many tissues, the brain, the liver, the heart, the skeletal muscle itself. Um, I think it's unlikely that the only thing irisin does is to brown the adipose tissue. I think it's unlikely that irisin does everything that exercise does. But we, um, we are very interested, especially, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in a terrible neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, as well as other diseases like ALS, neurodegenerative disease, exercise benefits these patients, but in many cases they can't exercise after the earlier stages. Furthermore, regarding the health of the brain, exercise is essentially the only thing that's known that can cause neurogenesis, the formation of new neurons in the apple of the brain. So it's a bit of a fantasy, I would say, but we at least have the fantasy that maybe irisin is one of the molecules that links, links exercise with the health of the brain. Well, at least if the idea may be wrong, but we'll go down swinging. We're going to, uh, you know, we're going 
all of the way into some of these questions. Now, to go into these questions, this is where we start to get a little biotech. The troll is a small molecule, a small protein like ours, 112 amino acids. It's a very fast tumor inside the system. In vivo, in our bodies, it would be made more or less constantly at whatever level is made, and cleared more or less constantly. The trouble is, if you take an injection of virus, it's going to be cleared very quickly. Um, so we, we, we engineer the molecule in it. So what we've been trying to do is to engineer the molecule in a form that could be useful as a therapeutic first thing preclinical models like mice, and maybe eventually a clinical trial of humans. So we use the trick that I had learned from my experiences in the biotech world, certainly as an advisor for the biotech, which is to fuse a polypeptide of interest to the immunoglobulin molecule, particularly a part of the immunoglobulin molecule, your antibody molecule is called FC. It doesn't matter what it is, it's just a fragment of, of your antibody molecules. But it is what endows your antibodies in your bloodstream with their stability in the blood. Your antibodies circulate for 60 days, 90 days without being cleared. They're very, very stable in the blood. So in the biotech world, it's always a good trick to try. Whatever your protein of interest, fuse it to the FC fragment of antibodies to see if it still works. Okay, so we did that. We made FC irisin and irisin FC two orientations, N and C terminus. Turns out that FC iris is not <coughs> dead, but iris and FC is very much alive. So we can make this as a fusion protein with an antibody molecule, part of an antibody molecule, and still, at least in cultured cells, seems to work. Okay, well that's, that's cool because the pharmacokinetics, what happens when it's injected into the blood, this is pretty well understood. Fusion to FC of antibodies will almost always stabilize the protein in the blood. So this shows you the time of hours in a mouse's bloodstream of a single bolus injection. This is the protein is not degraded. It has a T1 half in the mouse of about nine days. One injection. So this then becomes so simple that I can even talk my postdocs into doing the experiments. <laughs> so we took FC irisin or irisin FC as well as a control FC molecule. FC means the immunoglobulin, the antibody. One injection, 80 micrograms, 20, that works out to two mg per k of these molecules into a mouse, wild type mice, wait 10 days, harvest them at the end. And you can see that irisin FC causes a three and a half fold induction of uncoupling protein one, correlating with the brown and the white adipose tissues. And the single injection also improves, uh, reduces fasting insulin and uh, improves the glucose levels as well. So there's a suggestion here at least that we have a version of the protein. It may not be optimal. Um, it may well not be optimal, but at a laboratory scale, we have a version of the protein that allows us to do more chronic experiments without killing ourselves. Um, once a week injection it is not that bad. So the other thing I want to mention is that once you know that a molecule is active and it's used to the antibody molecule, it is also a nice tag for allowing staining of tissues to look at specific binding. So I'm just going to show you something that suggests that there is a specific, almost certainly there's a specific cell surface receptor to iris. So these are sections, uh, histological sections of adipose cells, which are incubated first with either human FC alone or iris and FC. The section is then washed and then stained with a fluorescent secondary light, so it really lights up where irisin is binding. And you can see a specific binding with irisin, but not with the FC alone. We've done a lot more work now, so we are quite convinced we can do fast uh, cell sorting, et cetera, with the irisin binding. So there does seem to be specific cell surface binding for this, suggesting really a, a, a hormone receptor kind of interaction. The nature of that receptor is under excruciating uh, a study at the moment. My postdoc, Pompus, is going back to Sweden in a few months and uh, 
where he's uh, doing everything he can to try to identify the receptor. Now, the reason, for those of you not in the biomedical world, the reason why the receptor is such a big deal is that, in theory, you could have a drug with irosin, but if you have the receptor, you could possibly design molecules without, besides irosin, maybe even synthetic compounds that could activate that receptor. So, um, uh, for, for purposes of the drug development, pharmacology, that's a, a really important tool. So um, it's a little bit of a race, I assume, and, uh, and Pontus is working hard on that and trying to get the Addison set. Okay, so let me, let me conclude uh, by saying that FMBC5 is an exercise in PG slot induced protein cleave to release a new molecule called Addison. We've also been trying to generalize the story in the following sense. This is not the only molecule that comes out of this analysis. It's the farthest advanced. The idea that putting PGC-1 alpha into muscle cells could be a, sort of an exercise of medic in a dish opens up a lot of doors. So my fellows have got a couple of other molecules that they really like also. So overall, the goal of the program is try to capture, to the extent we can, sort of perhaps some of the molecular aspects of exercise in terms of new specific molecules that perhaps mediate some. Irisin to be identified in the plasma of mice and humans. It's increased with exercise. It totally induces the browning of white fat, increased thermogenesis, <coughs> and metabolic. To, this, to, to date, we've done 10 day experiments. Um, we eventually have to do longer term studies to see whether the effect works off, how pronounced the effect can be. Um, therapeutic versions of this are being produced. Uh, a couple in my lab, mostly by Uber Therapeutics, a uh, company that I founded. We are not, we're academics, we're not going to make a thousand different versions of the molecule to test, but Ember Therapeutics is. Um, and lastly, um, irisin carries some of the positive effects of the exercise, perhaps in some of the other exercise sensitive conditions. It is, uh, is my, I come from the world of metabolic disease, I'm very interested, but I have to say it is really my dream to know and, and whether this can possibly bring benefit to neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, where there are hints that exercise is effective, but really a patient with ALS is not going to really be able to do an exercise program. So we'll see. And um, my acknowledgement slide, um, this work was really pioneered by Pontus Bolstrom from Gothenburg, Sweden, moving to the Karolinska in Stockholm. Um, June Wu, Kyle Rosbach, Jonathan Mark, Christiana Ron are all fellows. Uh, Sandra and Manisha are technicians. Steve Beebe and Mark Chedrachowski. Steve is a great proteomics person at Harvard and an important collaborator on many projects. We got the human exercise samples from Kurt Poland in Denmark. And lastly, I'd like to mention that the work was funded by the National Institutes of Health, specifically NIDK. This says 60 years NIDK has existed. They have funded me for 30 years. So uh, they made a long-term investment. I hope, they, uh, I hope we can provide some return on that investment. Lastly, I was told that I have to add that this is your next <laughs> lecture on that. <laughs> My friend Eric Olson, who's also very interested in muscle biomes, a great scientist. I recommend you come to Eric's talk. Thank you. And I'd be happy to try to answer some questions, including if there are questions from non-science people, non-biomedical people. Uh, it would be my pleasure to try to uh, try to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Technically, we are a little bit limited because the assay is a Western blot assay. When we first take the plasma, we get rid of the immunoglobulins and the albumin, and then we have to do Western blots. It's extremely awkward. So with a handful of subjects and a handful of samples, we did it. And we really have to have a better assay, like in the wise assay to stand for. So we're working on that, but I, I just it's, it would be too brutal. And, and, and also, the Western blocks are only semi-quantitative anyway, but it's a, it's a very good point. Important.
Yes, sir. You know, in the beginning, you showed some slides about type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And I got some sense of it as you were going through explaining what's happening. But the terminology and the conclusion left me sort of wondering. There was nothing about that. And maybe because I'm not familiar with the terminology. Okay. So uh, I'm going to clarify that. Yeah, like me, yeah okay. okay. 80 to 90 percent of type 2 diabetes um, in the United States is linked to obesity and overweight. Brown fat and browning of the white fat seems to do two things. First of all, it reduces the overall adiposity, the overall fatness of the animal. And secondly, it has direct anti-diabetic, it seems that direct anti-diabetic effects, not just through the effects on obesity. Brown fat is very good at taking blood uh, glucose and blood lipids and oxidizing them. Um, so I, 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 it's a good point. You raise a good question. The answer is not a thousand percent clear. Um, but I guess I would say that um, certainly the browning of adipose tissues works on both total adiposity as well. It probably has other effects on glucose on those spaces. That's what I Yeah, great lecture. Um, just that, I'm sure you've been asked many times, but if you're exercising, you want the energy to go to your muscles, so you can exercise. So why are the muscles that That's a great I'm going to make a homework and the back thing, the energy to go has picked up on a paradox. Sometimes when I'm giving a lecture on the subject, I mention the paradox. Exercise uses calories, and it increases heat production in your body. Why would you want to activate another process that uses calories and generates heat? So in our paper, we actually speculate um, in the discussion on this. So our speculation is the following, that this did not actually evolve as an exercise linked process, but rather is probably linked to shiver. Now, in modern society, we don't shiver. But shivering is a very important process in mammals. When mammals began their ascent at the age of the dinosaurs uh, and really took off, it was because we could handle cool environments that the lizards could. Key to that is um, the ability to tolerate cold environments. And what the, the first response to a cold environment is to shiver. Before adaptive thermogenesis of brown fat can work, your body shivers. And so we suspect that this evolved. Shivering is neuro, it's neuromuscular contraction. We suspect that this exists or was tolerated in exercise because of the need to send a humoral signal during shivering. And I can tell you in unpublished data, we have pretty good evidence now with, with a group in Sweden, Barbara Cannon and, uh, and Jan Hedegaard, have shown that even more robust induction of FNDC5 during shivering. But that's a great paradox, because otherwise the story doesn't exactly make sense. Yes? Lady with the red hair. Okay. Uh, do you have any evidence that might suggest that Verizon collaborates with other metabolic hormones such as leptin? Well, I don't know about leptin, but in our paper we show a collaboration with cyclic AMP and adrenergic signaling. Classically, you ask what's the hormone of thermogenesis? It's catecholamines and ad beta adrenergic signaling. We show it's mathematically synergistic uh, with that. With other hormones, we really haven't looked yet, but for sure. Uh, cyclic AMP and, um, and irisin seem to collaborate pretty effectively. Yes? So I have a question about the use of the mice and mm -hmm. I do studies in stress and depression, and we use swimming as a way to induce learned helplessness. Or we induce? We induce learned helplessness in our rats by letting them swim for 10 minutes where they become immobile. Yes. So how do you define exercise? Uh, what's different between exercise and trying to escape from the water? Because the mice don't have perception of exercise being good. 
They don't. That's not so <laughs> and I can tell you, they don't. They don't necessarily think it's good if you force them to run on a treadmill either. <laughs> I, that, that's a fair point. I mean, we we make the mice exercise. That they are exercising is abundantly clear. That there may not be other things. For example, if you force a mouse to, to run on a treadmill or you force a mouse to swim, there is stress involved as well. And it's just inevitable. If we're using a forced exercise protocol, certain times, certain rigid things, as opposed to just putting a wheel in a cage, there's going to be stress associated with it. That's a, that's a legitimate point. There's really no way around it if we want to give them distinct doses of exercise. Because if you put them in a, a box where they have the wheel, they have the choice to ride on that. Yeah. So do you do any experiments like this? No, we've never done that. Um, uh, and when we do exercise in our lab, we usually do forced exercise, which is a treadmill tread where they really have no choice. Partly because being molecular people, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point. But with humans, you can say, well, exercise on like 30 minutes, five times a day, you control. The trouble with the wheel running is that um, you get heterogeneity. One mice, you can't, if you're not making them run, if you're not doing distinct blocks, it's just scientifically not as good for the kinds of things we want to do. We have, you know, we're quite careful about humane treatment of the animals, I should say. As I said, we watch them the whole time. It's all under pretty distinct supervision. Uh, but we want distinct, measurable chunks. So every mouse has undergone the same amount of exercise. What you're suggesting, we throw all kinds of noise into them. It's, it's, it's reasonable, but it makes the data very noisy. Yes, sir? What's the receptor of errors? I, if I knew, oh. I wouldn't tell you. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually might tell you, but I don't know. Uh, we are working very hard on that. Um, I mean, it's just, it's the nature, again, for scientists who are not in this area, this is where the hot action would be. I think people, we don't have a far enough lead on the protein. I don't think people would necessarily try to compete with us in some of those things. But yeah, getting to the receptor first is a big deal and we're, we're working on it. Yes? Do you have a crystal structure? Hmm? Do you have a crystal structure? We do not have a crystal structure. We are trying to get a crystal structure. We have bad crystals of virus. We hope someday to have good crystals of virus. Virus has this unfortunate problem. There's two things about virus that make it difficult. Mammalian biologists will appreciate Irisin is very heavily glycosylated, like a lot of things in the blood are. Things that are heavily glycosylated basically won't crystallize and they have too much heterogeneity. Glycosylation is not so specific and unique. So you basically, the molecule is like Christmas trees hanging off of the glycosylation. The purpose of the glycosylation, in many purposes, is to keep it soluble in the blood. So we make it a bacteria without glycosylation, and guess what? It aggregates like so um, we are trying to work out our conditions where we can make it in bacteria and keep it from aggregating so that we can form distinct crystals. So we have soft crystals that don't diffract worth a darn right now. So we're, we're dealing with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, if a heart is an exercising muscle, and then there's some forms of stress, and your heart failure, PGC, one alpha, can be overexpressed. Yeah, yeah. And the evidence of the heart secretes uh, iris. It does. So, well, I, no, I don't. We've not studied that. FNDC5 is made in the heart. You're absolutely right. It's a good question. We just haven't really looked at that. I mean, it's not just a skeletal muscle. I know Eric Olson, who's speaking, uh, the next speaker, is very much interested in skeletal muscle and heart and their role in exercise. So ask Eric what he's done in the heart. Actually, I have to tell you, he had been working a little bit on the smaller field as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, first I say it's a beautiful piece of endocrinology. Can you make a UCP imitator to get into cells? To make like a UCP mimetic? Yeah. No, it's never been it, it's never been done in a way that is healthy. People have uncoupled mitochondria chemically. It turns out it's not that hard to make chemical uncoupling. 
just really, I, I'm, you know, I'm slightly embarrassed and once in a great while the viewers make us use a female cohort of mice. It's a good idea, it just doubles the expense of the experiment. But, um, but um, we have given iris into female mice and we get the same effect. So that I know. Um, I don't know that the estrus cycle really affects things one way or the other. I know that males often, male mice often get more obese, they're a little more aggressive about eating. Uh, than the female mice, um, but in terms of the exercise protocol, we've not done it with, with females. We have given female mice cytosine. <coughs> to yes. go back to the question of chronic exercise, who one is getting wrong? Is there such a thing as too much exercise? Is there such a thing as too much exercise? Well, I, I think you can damage yourself with exercise, and, and other people may be able to answer this better than I can. I don't know that data. I've never heard of, uh, of too much exercise except that eventually you can damage your joints. Um, uh, but in terms of the cardiovascular effects, um, I don't know that there's too much exercise. Well, For some I, rare individuals, it can cause problems. I mean, there are examples of uh, athletes on it. Is this ground into fat? Is it more or less guinea or is it broken down? Well, it's reversible. That I know. But the dose response, which I think is really what you're getting at, I, I actually don't know. And this, I think, is a, it's a very good question, but I should say that for us, it's sort of a means to an end of really molecular science. You're asking a very good question, but really a question for an exercise physiologist. Bob, you have a question. Yeah. Um, how large is the family of these five members? Like, are there five members? They're F and DC. I think one of them skipped. Great question. My first doc asked me to stay away from that because he's going to work on that back in school. So there is a whole family of these things. And um, their structure is, you know, we're talking 50% sequence identity. So whether, and I don't think any of the others are induced in exercise, but that doesn't mean they couldn't pharmacologically useful. So I think Pontus is planning on taking a look at that. Ah, one more in the back. Any idea what the, is there actually sound like protease that's uh, responsible? The protease? Yeah. I don't know what the protease is, but I will tell you it's pretty ubiquitous because we can, we can transfect FMDC5 to many different kinds of cells where it doesn't usually exist and we get what appears to be the same cleavage. So it looks like some sort of constitutive protease, or at least very widespread protease. Um, you know, we were thinking originally, is it muscle specific? Is it regulated with exercise? So far we don't, it's in the, but the word, I wouldn't say we have a definitive answer, but we have no evidence for it. And I showed you the FNDC5 is not in the liver. If you express the liver, it secretes the same exact molecule. So it looks like something, um, housekeeping or close to housekeeping. Great, well perhaps you can join me in and thank you guys.